Good morning, faithful early risers. Well, the great philosopher and theologian Tom Petty once sang, he sang, sure as night will follow day, most things I worry about never happen anyway. I love those lyrics, and I have to say that those uh, lyrics, that song has been floating around in my head pretty much the entire time we have been reading Adam Hamilton's book, Unafraid. David alluded to that very thing last week in his sermon as well, because it's just so true. Many of us do spend an inordinate amount of time just worrying about things and, and sometimes afraid of things that just never happen. But then we come to this final section of Hamilton's book as we finish up this book study today. The last section of his book, which is all about aging, illness, and dying. Three things guaranteed that are going to happen to us. We will get older, some of us older than others. We will all get sick, some of us sicker than others, and we will all die. Speaking of David, thank you, by the way, David, for uh, conveniently leaving this last section of the book to me <laughs> to preach about. Nothing like getting sick, getting old, and dying to really lift our spirits on a Sunday morning, right? <laughs> However, you, David, did take, uh, he did take the section on crime and racism and politics, so he, he took one for the team as well, so... Hamilton, Adam Hamilton did do a, a good job, I thought, in the book, reminding us that we are now uh, the healthiest, the wealthiest, the longest living people in the history of the world. Medical research has discovered cures and treatments that have elimin eliminated diseases that would have claimed lives, what would have wiped out entire segments of the population generations ago. And people who used to live uh, a long time ago with, with uh, horrible pain because of their diseases, now live relatively pain-free lives and normal lives and long lives because of, of medical advances. And furthermore, as he points out in the book and as research has shown, the longer we live, the happier we are. As Hamilton writes in his book, quote, by all outward measures, we have less to fear or worry about than at any time in human history. And he's right. Yet, we're increasingly afraid as a people. It's one of the great paradoxes of our times. Why are we more afraid, more afraid of aging and illness and dying? when we're healthier and we're living longer than ever. Well, when you think about it, it makes, it makes perfect sense. For instance, you know, why, why is it when we make more money, <clears throat> why is it when we have more that we're not satisfied, but instead that, that having more seems to make us want more? It sort of works the same way, doesn't it? We want more, we have more, so we want more. We live longer, so we want to live even longer. It seems like it's all a reminder that the question that we need to be asking ourselves is, from where? From where and from whom do we receive our ultimate meaning and our, and our ultimate security? Does it come from the things of the world or does it come to us from God? Now, with that said, there's nothing wrong, nothing wrong at all with the desire to live a long, healthy life. It's normal that we should have that desire. This is not a sermon, I promise, this is not a sermon advocating for short, unhealthy lifespans. 
This is a sermon about fear and about worry and how fear of sickness and fear of, of aging and fear of dying can rob us of our joy, steal our joy while we're living. As Hamilton right, rightly points out in the book, circumstances are surely going to arise that will, will seize us and, and make us anxious and fearful. Nobody is immune from this. The key to living unafraid, as the, the title of the book suggests, is to not be consumed by this. We're going to be fearful at times, but to not let the fear control us. And Jesus tells us why in our scripture today, why we shouldn't, or at least one reason, why we shouldn't allow fear to have so much, so much control over us. Because, he says, no matter what we're going through in life, no matter how challenging it might be, how hard it feels in the moment, we're never going through it alone. And that's big. That's important. Over the past uh, several years, I've become more and more familiar with the problem of loneliness in the world. And it's a, it's a big problem. I've read a lot about it. This week I read even more, a few more articles about loneliness, which some people are calling a new epidemic uh, in, in our culture. Various studies report that anywhere from 25% uh, to as high as 60% of adults say that they feel fairly to very lonely a lot of the time. 25 to 60%. Even if you take the low figure there, that's a, a significant number of people in the world which makes Jesus' words all the more relevant and powerful. In our scripture today, he is uh, speaking to his disciples in a section of John's gospel that's often called the farewell discourse. He's sharing his final thoughts with his, his very closest friends the night before his crucifixion. He's, he's anticipating his death. He's trying to prepare his disciples for it. So he wants uh, to comfort them in their grief which is, is imminent. And he tells them these beautiful words, well-known words, words that I will very often use uh, at funeral services myself, words that he uses to begin the farewell discourse. At the beginning of John chapter 14, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled, for I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. Comforting words about eternal life. But, but when the disciples hear this, they're afraid. They're not just, they're not just grieving that, that Jesus is leaving them. They're, they're terrified. It was C.S. Lewis Last century, C.S. Lewis, who said, no one ever told me that grief felt so much like fear. I'm not afraid, Lewis wrote, but the sensation is like being afraid. Some of you may have experienced that. Something similar in your own life. Grief that was so powerful, it, it felt like fear. The disciples' grief, fear, was grounded in their belief that they were going to be left alone. They were going to be without Jesus. And so Jesus tells them, you're not going to be alone. I will not leave you orphaned. Those are his words. But I'm giving you an advocate. Advocate is, is how the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, translates it. The word can be understood in, in various ways. Your Bible might even have a little footnote there at that word to take you to some other translations. Maybe it's advocate. Maybe it's helper. 
Maybe it's comforter. Maybe it's uh, intercessor, one who intercedes on our behalf. In other words, Jesus is telling his friends that even when he's gone, it might feel like they're alone, but they're not alone. He is with them. In the presence of the Holy Spirit, he is with them. Their advocate, their friend, who will never leave them. This is the same promise he makes you and me. We're going to face similar times. We're going to face difficulties. We're going to face challenges. And sometimes they're going to make us afraid. But we don't face them alone. And sometimes being alone is the, the worst part. Last year, when I had my heart attack, I was alone. I was by myself at home. I knew something wasn't right. I could feel it. I mean, literally feel it in my chest that something wasn't right. I was afraid. I mean, I, I was terrified. And so I called Lisa, called my wife, Lisa. I should have called 911. She reminds me of that regularly. <laughs> but I called Lisa. And simply hearing her voice, just hearing her voice, immediately calmed me. Even though she wasn't physically with me yet, her presence came through the telephone. And my fear, my fear was way up here. It just came down. It came down here so I could see. It came down here so I could breathe. It, just, it came down several nights. I was still fearful. It was a real heart attack. But I could think and I could see and I could breathe. She brought it down a few notches. The power of God's presence works like that. When we remember that Christ has promised to be with us and never leave us alone, he gives us his peace. I do not give to you as the world gives, he says. And thank God for that. Because when the world gives, the world gives with limitations. The world gives with regulations and with stipulations. Jesus doesn't give that way. Jesus gives his peace freely. And it is his grace. Jesus doesn't say, pay attention to the, to the scripture. Jesus doesn't just say, I leave you peace. He says, my peace I give to you. So we have the same peace that Jesus had. The same peace he had when he went to face his own death. So do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid, he said. Jesus knows uh, the rest of our story. And he knows that no matter what we're going through, no matter how much fear it might bring into our lives, because he knows the rest of our story, he knows we're going to be okay. Because he, of all people, knows that he's prepared a place. He's prepared an eternal home for us. And he says to us, just as he said to his disciples, I will come again and I will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. The good news of God today, the news that can help us face our worries, our fears, is that we're not alone, that we never have to face these fears by ourselves because the peace of Christ is always with us. He's with us in this life and in the life to come. I love how the United Church of Canada 
says it in their official statement of faith. If you go in the back of our hymnal, there are several affirmations of faith in the back of the hymnal. Affirmations that uh, uh, in one of my former churches, uh, we used to say these different affirmations uh, on Sundays. And one of the ones that we would say very often was the, the uh, United Canada, the Church of Canada's affirmation of faith, number 883. If I would have written my sermon in time before we, before we uh, had our uh, bulletins printed, I would have made sure it was in this week's order of worship. But I didn't write my sermon fast enough. But the United Church of Canada's statement of faith begins and ends like this. And I'll end my sermon with these words. Some of you may know this. It says, we are not alone. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.